Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with my last quarter of most anticipated releases for 2021. So these are going to be the books I'm super excited about for October through December, um, or the books, that, some of the books I'm most excited about, I should say, um, because believe it or not, I did narrow down this list, even though it's quite long. As usual, all kinds of genres and age ranges and all kinds of books. Um, and also, as usual, some of these I just have like basic story elements that interest me. Um, some of these I'm going to read out quotations from the synopsis because I feel like that's the clearest way to communicate what the books are about and why I'm excited about them. Um, and also, once again, it is really, really hot here, so I have the fan on. We are slowly starting to get some cooler weather, so hopefully these will not be issues for long. Um, but let's just get into the books. So, um, starting off with October, on October 5th I have Playing the Cards You're Dealt by Varian Johnson. Oh, I should mention I will link my other anticipated releases down below, um, and also I will put in a pinned comment links to all of the books I talk about. Um, so anyway, Playing the Cards You're Dealt by Varian Johnson. In the story we're following a young black boy who I believe um, he starts playing cards, I don't remember what the game is exactly, and um, he ends up making friends with this girl who I think also plays cards. And one of the things that really got me excited about this book, besides the fact that it is blurbed by Jason Reynolds, who I love and is one of my favorite authors, um, is the themes that it seems like it's going to talk about. They talk. It looks like the book is going to talk a lot about toxic masculinity, um, which I just think that sounds great, especially in a middle grade story. I feel like kids can understand stuff like that and we should be better about knowing that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one. And then on October 7th, I have Long Shadow by Olivia Atwater. This is the third book in the Regency Fairy Tale series. Um, I, I don't know if this video or my wrap up is going up first, but um, I read the first two books in that series and absolutely loved them. Um, I read both, I read one in one night and then one in the next night. I just am, this is like currently one of my favorite ongoing series and I'm so excited. This is a series of companion novels that are set in the Regency era and as you can tell they do involve fairies or magic. I just really love the romances and the character development um, and I really really love the themes. There's a lot in the first two books and I anticipate in this book as well. Um, there's a lot about the power and importance of anger, um, of being angry about things that are wrong in the world and like anger being healthy and like fueling you, um, which I really love. There's a lot about like how ordinary people have important stories to tell, which is something else I really love. Um, and this third volume, I can't really say too much about what it's about, but we do follow a character who we have met in other books, um, and it takes it has a female female romance. And I believe that the main characters are fighting against a particular um, fairy lord who is like one of the extra bad ones. Um, yeah, I just really love a lot of things about this series, and I can't wait for this most recent installment. Um, October twelfth is the trouble. Girls of Dragomir Academy by Anne Ursu. This is kind of embarrassing. I have still only read one book by Anne Ursu, even though I own several others by her, um, which I, I read The Real Boy and absolutely adored it. So she's pretty much an auto read author for me, even though I've only read one book. Um, but this is a fantasy novel, and we're following our main character, Maria, um, and her brother has always had really great things expected of him, um, and nobody's really expected much from her. And then one day she messes something up. Um, I can't remember what it is, but she gets invited to a mysterious school for wayward young girls called the Dragomir Academy which promises Maria and her classmates a chance to make something of themselves in service to one of the country's powerful sorcerers. But as they learn how to fit into a world with no place for them, they begin to discover things about the magic the men of their country wield, as well as the dread itself. So the dread is, I think, like a, like a magical sickness or something like that. Um, things that threaten the precarious balance upon which Illyria is built. And Illyria is um, the world or the country. And I am so excited for this. I'm pretty sure this is the book that I remember Anne Ursu talking about on Twitter as being like feminist rage fueled, um, which I just love. <laughs> uh, and people, people underestimate middle grade's ability to cover those things, but I think this is going to be fantastic. Um, also on October 12th, I have Jade Fire Gold by June C. L. Tan. Um, this is a book that is inspired by Chinese mythology with rich magic and an epic slow burn romance. I'm excited. Um, in an empire on the brink of war, An is no one, with no past and no family. Altan is a lost heir, his future stolen away as a child. When they meet, Altan sees in An a path to reclaiming the throne. An sees a way to finally unlock her past and understand her arcane magical abilities. Um, I think the mythology sounds wonderful. I'm so excited about these characters and the slow burn romance. Um, I just think this sounds fantastic. And then on October 19th, I have Our Way Back to Always by Nina Moreno. Um, this is a standalone, but it is set in the same, I think, city as Don't Date Rosa Santos, which I love. It was one of my favorite books the year I read it. Um, and this one, like, 
the premise doesn't sound like necessarily things I would like, like they're not tropes that I tend to enjoy um, because we have like a childhood friends I think to lovers romance and there's also like a bucket list plot. Um, our main character is this really overachieving girl who um, realizes as she's about to graduate that she hasn't done any of the things she wanted to do before she graduated from high school so she enlists the help of um, her childhood friend who I think is like back in town or something and they end up going on these adventures together um, and I think falling in love and yeah like friends to lovers is not my thing. I don't like bucket list or scavenger hunt plots but I love Nina Moreno so I feel like I'm gonna love this anyway. Um, also I do love a good overachieving main character. Also on October 19th is The Ghosts of Marshley Park by Amanda Inez and this is one of the ones I'm just gonna like read the synopsis. Um, Jade Roberts is a modern girl with an anger management problem and nothing makes her more mad than turning up dead. Julian Pendle is a Victorian era ghost who wants to be left in peace. When Jade enlists Julian's aid to help solve her murder he reluctantly agrees if only to hasten her departure. But as Julian acquaints Jade with existence outside the living world, she in turn shows him some of what he's been missing. And as their investigations continue, they discover they may have more in common than they realized. Ghost boyfriend trope. Like, need I say more? <laughs> um, well, I should, probably. But I, it's one of my favorite tropes. I'm very excited for this. Um, I actually, like, commented on Goodreads about like that trope being in here and the author actually replied and said that that's that's not like a huge part of what the book is about so I'm going in knowing it's going to be not the main focus of the story um but I just am still really excited about that one um also on October 19th is Baraka Beats by Maliha Siddiqui our main character is a girl named Nimra who transfers from an Islamic school to public school and the transition is very hard on her she's not being treated very well um and also I think her best friend is starting to pull away from her um and then she gets asked to join the band at school but she was always taught that music was not allowed in Islam um so she's not sure what to do she decides that she will join but she'll drop out um as soon as she's able to win her friend back because I think her friend is in the band as well um but then she starts liking it and the band ends up signing up for a talent show to benefit refugees but she's still worried about her friendship and her parents but she also wants to remain true to herself um so I think the book is about that conflict I feel like one of the things I was seeing from the author and I think from own voices reviews as well is that this is an example of really unapologetic Muslim representation um like that is an important part of the story it's an important part of Nimra's life and I just think this sounds like a really wonderful story and I'm excited to read this one. Also on October 19th I have a nonfiction book and that is Girly Drinks A World History of Women and Alcohol by Mallory O'Meara. Um, when I first when I saw this book cover and I read the title I had like a visceral <laughs> reaction to it. Um, I don't drink very much at all but on the rare occasions that I do I tend to like drinks that have some kind of fruit flavor to them or that kind of thing. Um, girly drinks you might say and so this sounds like something I definitely want to read about. It's a nonfiction book that um, celebrates the ignored history of an, the important role that women have played in the historical and cultural place of alcohol. Um, and then here's a quote from the synopsis. With whip smart insight and boundless curiosity, girly drinks unveils an entire untold history of the female distillers, drinkers, and brewers who have played a vital role in the creation and consumption of alcohol. From ancient Sumerian beer goddess Ninkasi to iconic 1920s bartender Ada Coleman. Filling a crucial gap in culinary history, Omira dismantles the long-standing patriarchal traditions at the heart of these very drinking cultures, in the hope that readers everywhere can look to each celebrated woman in this book and proudly have what she's having. Um, I just think that sounds fascinating. Also on October 19th, this is a big release day as you can see, is Little Thieves by Margaret Owen. Um, this is the first in a series and it is a fairy tale retelling of the Goose Girl story, which I have been finding. I really like those retellings. Um, and this is definitely a dark take on one and actually after, like I mentioned for the novella that I read, um, how interested I was in the fact that the main character we're following is actually the maid um, and not the princess. And I thought that was such a cool concept and I was like, I'm surprised I haven't seen more stories like this. Well, this is another one because we are following the maid character. Um, our main character is the adopted daughter of death and fortune, which sounds really interesting, and her name is Vanya, but she takes the place of a princess named Giselle. Now Vanya leads a lonely but lucrative double life as princess and jewel thief, charming nobility while emptying their coffers to fund her great escape. She's trying to get enough money to like escape from their control or something like that. Then, one heist away from freedom, Vanya crosses the wrong god and is cursed to an untimely end, turning into jewels, stone by stone, for her greed. Vanya has just two weeks to figure out how to break her curse and make her getaway. And with the feral guardian half-god, Giselle's sinister fiancé, and an over-eager junior detective on Vanya's tail, she'll have to pull the biggest grift yet to save her own life. Okay, I think I was maybe able to adjust the brightness. I'm sorry this video is such a mess, you guys, but we're just gonna call it a casual one, okay? Um, so next on October 26th, I have The Perks of Loving a Wallflower by Erica Ridley. Um, this is a sapphic romance that I heard about from Cousin at Always Doing. Um, she recently did a review and this just sounded wonderful. Um, and I believe it also has a 
one of the two lead characters, um, I believe is non-binary, um, which is not something we see a lot in romance and especially in historical romance. Um, this character does use she, her pronouns though, so that is what I'm going to use during this video. Um, but I'm just going to read part of the synopsis. As a master of disguise, Thomasina Winchester can be a polite young lady or a body old man, anything to solve the case. Her latest assignment unveils a top secret military cipher covering up an enigma that goes back centuries. But when Tommy's beautiful new client turns out to be the highborn lady she's secretly smitten with, more than her mission is at stake. Loose talking Miss Philippa York doesn't believe in love. Her cold heart didn't pitter patter when she was betrothed to a duke, nor did it break when he married someone else. All Philippa desires is to rescue her priceless manuscript and decode its clues to unmask a villain. She hates that she needs a man's help, so she's delighted to discover the clever, charming baron at her side is in fact a woman. Her cold heart, did it just pitter patter? Uh, I just think that sounds wonderful. I'm very excited about it, and knowing that Cousin loves it um, also has me optimistic. Um, Next is one of my most anticipated releases for the whole year. I have been excited about this since I found out about it. I'm pretty sure my friend Jocelyn like mentioned this one to me because she knows I love um, ballet retellings, and that is Midnight in Everwood by M.A. Kuzniar. Um, this one, I will tell you right now, I have already pre-ordered it. Um, and I actually did something that I don't think I've ever done before, which is that I ordered two special editions, like two different ones, of this book that I have not read. Um, I don't think I've done that before, but I am just so excited about this one and so confident that I'll love it, so I hope I do. Um, but this is a Nutcracker retelling, and our main character is named Marietta, and she loves ballet. She's a ballet dancer, um, but in proper Edwardian society, she is now getting too old to do that. Um, so she has to, you know, she has to like enter the marriage market and all of that. So, and then like um, this, mysterious inventor named Drosselmeyer I think moves in next door or something um, or he ends up meeting the family. When Drosselmeyer constructs an elaborate set for Marietta's final ballet performance she discovers it carries a magic all of its own. On the stroke of midnight on Christmas Eve she is transported to a snowy forest where she encounters danger at every turn. Ice giants, shadow goblins, and the shrieking mist all lurk amidst the firs and frozen waterfalls and ice cliffs. After being rescued by the butterscotch-eyed captain of the King's Guard, she is escorted to the frozen sugar palace. At once, Marietta is enchanted by this glittering world of glamorous gowns, gingerbread houses, miniature reindeer, and the most delicious confectionery. But all is not as it seems, and Marietta is soon trapped in the sumptuous palace by the sadistic King Galum, who claims her as his own. She is confined to a gilded prison with his other pets, Delara, whose words are as sharp as her teeth, and Perlopata, a princess from another land. Marietta must forge an alliance with the two women to carve away free from this sugar-coated but treacherous world and back home to follow her dreams. Yet in a hedonistic world brimming with rebellion and a forbidden romance that risks everything, such a path will never be easy. Um, sorry, that was kind of a long bit to read, but I just am so excited about every aspect of this book. Um, I really love stories that have this really whimsical and beautiful world building, but then there's like that darkness underneath. Um, I love ballet retellings. I think this one sounds really interesting. Um, I just feel like the atmosphere is going to be great, and I can't wait for it. I hope I love it. Um, and then moving into the November books, on November 2nd, Lore Olympus Volume 1 comes out by Rachel Smith. Or Smith. Um, this is a webtoon turned graphic novel that I am going to be the last one I think to read, but I knew, like, I knew I would love it and I was like, I can't get sucked into like a webtoon, like web comic type thing right now. Um, I was like, I'm going to hold out for a physical copy and they are in fact doing one. I'm so excited. This is a Hades and Persephone retelling. I love the art. Um, I, lo I love what I've heard that the story is like, so I feel like everyone probably already knows about this one, but I'm excited. Also on November 2nd, I have Love and Lavender by Josie S. Kilpack. Um, I received this copy from the publisher in exchange for an honest review, so thank you so much. And I have actually read this one. You will hear more about it in my wrap-up. Um, if that has already gone up, I will link it, but if it hasn't, you will be hearing that very soon. Um, and this is a romance featuring a marriage of convenience trope, which I love. Um, this is also in their proper romance line, so there's not going to be any explicit scenes. And our two main characters um, are a heroine who has a club foot and a male lead who is autistic. Um, and I just think that's really wonderful to see in a historical romance and again you will hear more of my thoughts but I did really enjoy this one spoiler alert also on November 2nd is Gilded by Marissa Meyer um, I'm so excited that Marissa Meyer is returning to fairy tale retellings this is a Rumpelstiltskin retelling um, and I don't remember too much about the specifics of the synopsis because I just know I'm gonna read it and I'm really excited about it um, I have really enjoyed everything I've read from Marissa Meyer so far um, and this is again a Rumpelstiltskin retelling all I really remember is that the main character is brought to the Goblin King's kingdom because um, um, I think she's like a con artist or something. She's like been able to trick people into thinking she can make gold and I don't think she actually can. Um, yeah, I don't need to know much about this. I'm just really excited for it. Um, also on November 2nd is Dreams Lie Beneath by Rebecca Ross. And Rebecca Ross, like every time I mention one of her books I'm excited about, I have to 
like be so embarrassed about the fact I haven't read any of her books yet. Like I just, I feel like I'm gonna love them. And I now gotten to the point where I'm nervous to try one because what if I don't love it? <laughs> Which is ridiculous. But anyway, I'm adding this one to the list. Um, and this is, I think a standalone so far. Um, and this book deals with dreams a lot. There is this curse of nightmares um, that are brought to life every new moon and these nightmares are held off by magicians. Um, and our main character gets drawn into a competition because I think she's supposed to take over the protection of her town um, but she gets challenged for it so she gets drawn into this competition and she has to team up with one of her rivals to fight the realm's curse. Um, and it also says something about her seeking revenge for something. I just feel like I'm gonna like this. I hope one day to actually read Rebecca Ross, um, but until then I'll just be excited about all her books. Um, and then also on November 2nd I have A Rush of Wings by Laura E. Weymouth. Speaking of authors that I am so confident I'll love and I still haven't tried, this is another one. Um, I actually looked up the name of this retelling this time, so go me. This is a retelling of the Six Swans story. This is the one that I can never remember the name of, but I actually looked it up. It's the one where um, the main character has to be like silent for seven years when her brothers get turned into swans. Um, and there's usually like a wicked stepmother kind of thing. So in this version, our main character is named Rowena and she has, I think three brothers, maybe three brothers. I don't know. Um, and their mother comes back wrong. Like something happens and she doesn't seem to be herself anymore. Um, and whoever this person is ends up cursing Rowena's brothers um, into swans. And I think she also, curses this boy named Gowan who is not related to them um, and Rowena and him end up teaming up together. The synopsis says forced to flee Rowena travels to the city of Inverness to find a way to break the curse but monsters take many forms and in Inverness Rowena is soon caught in a web of strangers who want to use her raw magic for their own gain. If she wishes to save herself and the people she loves most Rowena will have to take her fate into her own hands and unlock the power that has evaded her for so long. Also on November 2nd I have a nonfiction book and that is Wholehearted Faith by Rachel Held Evans finished and collected by Jeff Chu. Um, this is the last book that Rachel Held Evans was working on at the time of her very early death a couple of years ago. Um, this was the last book that we're gonna get from her, um, which is really sad, um, but I'm really glad that it has been finished by a very good friend of hers, Jeff Chu, who I've also heard really wonderful things about his writing. Um, I finally read my first book by Rachel Held Evans a couple months ago and I thought it was excellent. I'm just going to, again, read part of the synopsis here. At the time of her tragic death in 2019, Rachel was working on a new book about wholeheartedness. With the help of her close friend and author Jeff Chu, that work in progress has been woven together with some of her other unpublished writings into a rich collection of essays that ask candid questions about the stories we've been told and the stories we tell, about our faith, ourselves, and our world. This book is for the doubter and the dreamer, the seeker and the sojourner, those who long for a sense of spiritual wholeness, as well as those who have been hurt by the church but can't seem to let go of the story of Jesus. Through theological reflection and personal recollection, Rachel wrestles with God's grace and love, looks unsparingly at what the church is and does, and explores universal human questions about becoming and belonging, an unforgettable, moving, and intimate book. Um, I'm getting emotional just like reading the synopsis, so I think it's gonna be even more so when I actually read this book, but this is another one I have pre-ordered. Um, I think it's going to be wonderful. I'm sure I'm going to cry a lot. It, It's really hard, like we lost a really incredible person when we lost Rachel, and I'm glad we're going to get this kind of last offering from her. Then on November 4th, I have Skin of the Sea by Natasha Bowen. This is a fantasy novel that is inspired by West African mythology. Um, this is another one I've been excited about for quite a while, and I think this cover is stunning as well. Our main character is Simideli, or Simidel, um, one of the Mamiwata, a, who are mermaids duty bound to collect the souls of those who die at sea and bless their journeys back home to the Supreme Creator. But when a living boy is thrown overboard a slave ship, Simi saves his life, going against an ancient decree and bringing terrible danger to the Mamiwata. Now Simi must journey to the Supreme Creator to make amends, a journey of vengeful gods, treacherous lands, and legendary creatures. If she fails, she risks not just the fate of all Mamiwata, but also the world as she knows it. Um, this has a lot of buzzwords for me. I like stories about mermaids. Um, I like stories about helping people cross over. I find that really interesting. Um, and it looks like this book uses fantasy elements to deal with like history and to deal with really serious issues like slave ships. Um, so I just think this sounds really like a fantastic book and I can't wait to read it. Um, and then also on November 4th, I have one that I just put on my list, um, and that is Fledgling by Lucy Hope. Um, so my friend Mariana from Mariana Mass Books, she mentioned this one. She was like, I think you would like this. And she's correct. This looks wonderful. So I'm just going to pull up the Goodreads page on my phone. <laughs> a dark Gothic adventure set in the Bavarian forest with angels and owls and magic and a boy who isn't all that he seems to be. 
A cherub is blown into Cassie Angle's bedroom during a thunderstorm, triggering a series of terrifying events. Cassie must discover if its arrival was an accident or part of something more sinister. With a self-obsessed opera singer for a mother, a strange taxidermist father, and a best friend who isn't quite what he seems, Cassie is forced to unearth the secrets of her family's past. As the dark forces gather around them, can Cassie protect all that she holds dear? The fantastic debut novel from Lucy Hope with cover illustration by Anna Schepetta. I do love this cover and I really like that they um, list the illustrator for the cover in the synopsis. So doesn't that just sound super interesting? I'm really excited about that one as well. Um, and then on November 9th, I have another one of my most anticipated releases for the whole year, and that is A Snake Falls to Earth by Darcy Little Badger. Um, Aletsue was one of my absolute favorite books I read last year, so I was gonna basically be excited about this no matter what it was about, um, but the synopsis also sounds really interesting. So it says this book is inspired by traditional Lapan Apache storytelling structure, and here's a bit from the synopsis. Nina is a Lapan girl in our world. She's always felt there was something more out there. She still believes in the old stories. Ali is a cottonmouth kid from the land of spirits and monsters. Like all cottonmouths, he's been cast from home. He's found a new one on the banks of the bottomless lake. Nina and Ollie have no idea the other exists, but a catastrophic event on Earth and a strange sickness that befalls Ollie's best friend will drive their worlds together in ways they haven't been in centuries, and there are some who will kill to keep them apart. Again, I was going to be excited no matter what, but I do think that synopsis sounds really, really interesting. Um, and then also on November 9th, I have Out of My Heart by Sharon M. Draper. Um, this is a sequel to Out of My Mind, which I read on the re recommendation of Olivia Savannah um, and her sister Simone as well. That first book follows our main character, Melody, who has cerebral palsy. And we're following Melody in her daily life and also what happens when she finally um, gets the opportunity to use this new technology to communicate more directly with people. Um, and I thought that was a really wonderful book. And this is a sequel that is set one year later. Um, and I believe it takes place when Melody wants to go to camp. Um, so it's set during camp and that's not normally like a setting that I enjoy but because I have really enjoyed the first book I know I'm gonna like this one as well um, so yeah I'm excited for that one too and then on November 11th I have a graphic novel and that is Who to F are you by Huda Fami um, this is semi autobiographical and we're following our main character slash the author named Huda um, who moves to a new school in Dearborn Michigan where there is a high Muslim population um, and specifically at her new school there's a lot of girls who wear hijab and at our main character's old school um, she was the only hijab Jobby there so that was kind of like part of her identity and the way she saw herself and so now it's about our main character having to um, define herself more specifically or differently and I've seen good early reviews for this one and I just think this sounds really really interesting and um, I really like the idea of the topics and the themes it's going to talk about um, like the way like you know defining identity in relation to other people and then how when you don't have that difference anymore um, how how you're going to define yourself going forward I just think that sounds really wonderful so I'm excited for that um, and then on November 16th, I have a picture book, and that is the 1619 Project, Born on the Water, by Nicole Hannah-Jones and Renee Watson, illustrated by Nicholas Smith. Um, and I heard about this one from Ashley at Bookish Realm, whom I love. I will link her down below. All the people I mentioned, I will link down below. Um, and this, like, the artwork for this picture book looks absolutely gorgeous. This is another book I have pre-ordered. Um, and from what Ashley said, the story is also really beautifully told. So it's about a black main character who is... Um, trying to learn more about her family history, but like many African American people, because of the legacy of slavery, um, it's really hard to trace her family. And so I think it's her mother who tells her stories about where they came from. And I don't feel like I'm doing a good job of explaining this book. Um, so again, check out Ashley where she talks about, I'll try to link the wrap up where she reviews this one. But the book deals with um, memory and history and family. And again, the lasting trauma of slavery. And I just think this looks like a really, really important book. And then on November 30th, I have a new release by one of my favorite authors, I mentioned earlier. Um, that is Stunt Boy in the Meantime by Jason Reynolds. Again, I love Jason Reynolds. I think this is his first book that has a speculative element because um, our main character, oh by the way, this is illustrated by Raul III, um, and this is about our main character who is a young boy who is a superhero and his power is basically like taking care of other superheroes and like other people that he loves. Um, like he looks out for his parents, he looks out for his friends, um, he looks out for the cat who, who, that somebody in the apartment near him owns. Like basically his abilities are taking care of people. But it looks like things are starting to unravel because his parents are looking to get a divorce. Um, I think Stunt Boy also deals with anxiety and that's part of it as well. And he also has an arch nemesis who is trying to prove that um, Stunt Boy is not so super after all or not so special after all. Um, I have really enjoyed everything I've read by Jason Reynolds. I love the concept of this one so this is another like easy anticipated release, like easy pre-order. I'm not telling you all the books I've pre-ordered but like I just am mentioning it occasionally I guess. Um, and then also November 30th, I have Spell Sweeper by Lee Edward Foti. Um, so this one I actually, somebody mentioned it to me 
that it's like um, an upcoming release that sounded really cute and from what they said about it I was like yeah it sounds like something I'd be interested in and then I looked it up on Goodreads and not only does the premise sound great but the main character is named Kara and I'd be lying if I said that didn't add to my excitement a little bit. Um, those of you who have uncommon names, um, you know how exciting it is when you come across your name. So I'm really excited about this. Um, it's her battle main character named Kara, and she fails her magic test, sadly. Um, so she basically gets put on cleanup duty. She's kind of a magical like janitor at this very prestigious magical school named Dragon Song Academy. Um, and then I'm going to read part of the synopsis here. And no one makes more of a mess than Dragon Song Academy's star student, Harley. Widely believed to be the chosen one who's destined to save the magical world, she makes magic look easy. So of course, she's Kara's sworn nemesis. Or she would be, if she even knew Kara existed. But then Harley's spells begin to leave behind something far worse than spell dust, rifts in the fabric of magic itself. Soon Kara begins to suspect that the so-called chosen one isn't going to save the world. She's going to destroy it. It will take more than magic to clean up a mess this big. Fortunately, messes are kind of Kara's thing. I just think that sounds lovely. Like I love a deconstruction of the chosen one trope and I just think this sounds wonderful. And again, I am also excited to read about a main character who shares my name. Also on November 30th, I have a nonfiction book and that is The Defiant Middle, How Women Claim Life's In-Betweens to Remake the World by Kaya Oaks. Um, as you can see, I was very kindly sent a review copy in exchange for an honest review and I'm so, so excited about this. Um, I actually am almost done reading Kaya Oaks' memoir. I haven't talked about it anywhere because I'm taking it very slowly and I didn't want to feel like pressure to review it quickly even though I'm the one who puts pressure on myself anyway um but I'm really really loving it and I was really excited that she was coming out with this book um uh, Kaya Oaks is a Catholic feminist writer who I really really enjoy again everything I've read from her online and elsewhere so this is another one where I'm just going to read part of the blurb here um women are expected to be many things they should be young enough but not too young old enough but not too old creative but not crazy passionate but not angry they should be fertile and feminine and self-reliant not barren or butch or solitary women in other words are caught between social expectations and a much more complicated reality Women who don't fit in, whether during life transitions or because of changes in their body, mind, or gender identity, are carving out new ways of being in and remaking the world. But this is nothing new. They have been doing so for thousands of years, often at the margins of the same religious traditions and cultures that created these limited ways of being for women in the first place. In The Defiant Middle, Kaya Oaks draws on the wisdom of women mystics and explores how transitional eras or living in marginalized female identities can be both spiritually challenging and wonderfully freeing, ultimately resulting in a reinvented way of seeing the world and changing it. Change, after all, Oaks writes, always comes from the margins. I just think this sounds really incredible. I'm very excited about the project of this book. And yeah, so it's basically about women who don't fit into cultural expectations and um, all of the really, really important work that they do, all the really important scholarship and um, like community work that they do and how women have been doing this for thousands of years. Um, so I just think this sounds really, really wonderful and specifically it's going to focus on um, the spiritual aspect and I believe the like social and community aspect um, of that really important work. And I can't wait to get into this. Um, you will see this in a review um, before, hopefully before publication, which is November 30th, like I said. And again, I'm just so grateful to have this review copy. I can't wait. Okay, and then I only have two books so far um, on my radar for December. The first one comes out on December 7th, and that is Call Us What We Carry by Amanda Gorman. Um, I don't know, I think she was originally supposed to have a poetry collection coming out earlier, and I don't know if that one got pushed back or if that got absorbed into this release. I don't know exactly what happened with that, but regardless, I am incredibly excited about this. This is a poetry collection by um, the Poet Laureate or the Youth Poet Laureate, who again, um, she did that performance at the inauguration earlier this year, and and um, I, I apologize to my international friends who might be sick of hearing about this, but it is like I have watched that several times. Like, I just think she's an incredible writer, an incredible performer and person. And I am so, so excited to have more poetry from her. Um, I just I think she's incredibly talented and I am so glad that we get more from her now. And then finally, the last book I'm going to talk about today also comes out on December 7th, and that is a nonfiction book called The Bright Ages, A New History of Medieval Europe by Matthew Gabriel and David Perry. Um, and this is another one I'm just gonna like read part of the synopsis for. Um, I'm sorry there were more of those than usual in this video, um, but this just sounds incredible. This is basically like looking at the, the Dark Ages again um, and kind of reevaluating them and looking at like, yes, there were all of these really horrible, bloody, um, you know, just unpleasant things happening, but there was also a lot of progress and a lot of um, beauty as well. A lively and magisterial popular history that refutes common misperceptions of the European Middle Ages, showing the beauty and communion that flourished alongside the dark brutality, a brilliant reflection of humanity itself. The 
historic medieval conjures images of the Dark Ages, centuries of ignorance, superstition, stasis, savagery, and poor hygiene. But the myth of darkness obscures the truth. This was a remarkable period in human history. The Bright Ages recasts the European Middle Ages for what it was, capturing this thousand-year era in all its complexity and fundamental humanity, bringing to light both its beauty and its horrors. The Bright Ages takes us through ten centuries and crisscrosses Europe and the Mediterranean, Asia and Africa, revisiting familiar people and events with new light cast upon them. We look with fresh eyes on the fall of Rome, Charlemagne, the Vikings, the Crusades, and the Black Death, but also to the multi-religious experience of Iberia, the rise of Byzantium, and the genius of Hildegard and the power of queens. We begin under a blanket of golden stars constructed by an empress with Germanic, Roman, Spanish, Byzantine, and Christian bloodlines, and end nearly 1,000 years later with the poet Dante, inspired by that same twinkling celestial canopy, writing an epic saga of heaven and hell that endures as a masterpiece of literature today. The Bright Ages reminds us just how permeable our man-made borders have always been, and of what possible worlds the past has always made available to us. Um, yeah, I just love this. this the sound of this, um, I like that it's going to like incorporate some lesser known aspects while also talking about the you know famously bad aspects of the middle ages um, and i also really like that it's going to it seems like it's going to take a very global perspective and a very inclusive perspective um like judging on some of the people and places that the synopsis mentions so i can't wait for this i think this sounds really fantastic and um yeah really excited about that one so those are the rest of the books for 2021 that i am very excited about um our final quarter of the year um and also this is probably a good time to mention that you guys probably have been hearing about all of the supply issues um, going on so if you are planning to order books whether for yourself or for a holiday gift or anything like that um, definitely do that sooner rather than later and also be kind to your local booksellers and anybody else involved in the industry because it's not their fault like they can't do anything about it um, the shortages are not their fault and um, especially with COVID and everything still going on and like that on top of recovering from the shortages from last year like there's just a lot going on right now like there's a lot of factors just piling on top of each other and none of them are the fault of like local workers or anything like that so um just keep that in mind and please comment down below and let me know if you are also excited about any of these books or one of your most anticipated releases for the end of the year thank you guys so much for watching i will see you soon with another video and i hope you love the next book you read bye